um, on the Social Security Legislation Amendment, Stronger Penalties for Serious Failures, Bill 2014. The question is that this bill be now read a second time, and I call the member for Bowman. Deputy Speaker, there's surely no important mission for a government than providing opportunity. If you could distill the job of every one of us in this chamber down to one single word, that is the task that we devote our energies to here. Look, of course, it's a little bit of a, a disappointment, of course, from this side of the chamber if most of the debate focuses upon punishment and punitive measures, because that's not what this bill is about at all. Let's take a broader picture here that we're a leading economy and our job is to maximise workforce participation in a nation that has a small population, a relatively large capital to labour ratio. It's actually extremely hard to fill the high-skilled jobs with our own population, but it presents us also with a challenge, a lack of low-skilled jobs for many of those who are entering the workforce for the first time. And it's that skills mismatch that, that we grapple with as a wealthy economy with a high minimum wage, excellent working conditions. And we are in the company of great economies around the world who are grappling with the same question, how do we make sure that everyone can have a chance at a better future? Our job isn't to take money from people. Our job is not to pick winners. But our job, surely, as a government, is to give every citizen opportunity. And if we can be doing that, we're doing that job well. And in that job network framework, of course, we rely on highly skilled professional people who work in these tasks of matching need with expertise, finding opportunity and giving it to those who are best capable of filling it. And in a merit-based arrangement as we have in employment, I can't ask a, a boss to take the second best employee, uh, nor can I ask any job seeker to take a job for which they are not suitable. We are in a race, of course, to identify and to guide people to the best possible professional path. And all of this is underpinned by a debate that goes back uh, centuries that have identified that being in work is far better for one's health, far better for one's social circumstances, far better for families. We know that families without an individual engaged in real work genuinely struggle, that the odds are stacked against them. And unfortunately, when you rank countries identifying those that have the highest proportion of households without a single person working, Australia keeps popping up on the top. It's Australia, New Zealand, UK, Malta. The light flashes, they hit the screen. These are the economies that continue to cultivate and support large proportions of our working population having no work at all. Families that have no one working and creating generations of future families where nobody works. We can't rest until this problem is sorted. We can't rest until we have done our very best to make sure that every person in these particular households has had a crack at a job. And I can't put it much more simply than that. And we identify that of the hundreds of thousands of matches that are made by professionals in, in our RTOs and our job service providers every year, that in most cases these are bilaterally both beneficial and welcomed arrangements, where both a boss and a work uh, and a job seeker are fulfilling mutually satisfying and, um, and encouraging arrangements. And in many cases they have a tough period to find a job, but once they have it, they're set for life. Government's only task should be in that period of highest need, and government should not be getting involved in arrangement between employees and, and uh, employers because that should be the domain for those to make the rules and to make sure that they are productive arrangements without interference from unions or government. So let's focus on that difficult time. I've had a time when I didn't have a job and life looked pretty precarious. I can't even pretend to know what it's like to be a long-term unemployed person, but I know this. You know, short of losing your family home, short of losing a first degree family member, probably not having a job is one of the most precarious uh, phases in one's life. And I think the job of a government is to make sure that's a period that is as short as possible. And I think the opposition makes a fair point that the government should be doing all it can to make that a supported period rather than one where one feels picked on, uh, rather than where someone feels that there is futile activity that's not actually leading to employment at all. Because there's one thing that's for sure, uh, we as public, uh, publicly funded officials feel that we know what the job environment is like, but let me tell you, young people on the ground know a very different picture, and that is a picture that's incredibly hard to find suitable work. And it doesn't matter what part of Australia you're in, I can uh, cherry pick some areas where there's very, very high youth unemployment, but even in my fairly uh, you know, average outer metro area that very much represents middle Australia, it's extremely hard for young people to find a job at the right time. Now look, next week they may well find that opportunity that sets them a great trajectory for life, but nothing can really help them in that one period 
where they're looking for work, accept the best possible and responsive government services. That's what we're debating today. And today we're focusing really on that, uh, that, that, that what we call the hard end of the spectrum, where it's proving most difficult to get people a suitable job. And of course, the system can only do so much. They can only put a prospective job seeker in front of an employer. There's nothing we can really do to make that relationship work. We can't really ensure that both parties are acting in good faith, though I hope they do. Ultimately, all we can do is match that range of opportunities with those job seekers uh, that are chasing them. We want to hope, of course, that if someone goes as far as turning up for a job interview, that they'll take it seriously. And if someone doesn't even turn up for those meetings, then there has to be a very good reason why. As a former GP, I know that often it's health reasons that undermine those meetings. And that's why we recognise both sides of politics that over a six-month period you can have a couple of shots at it. We give you three chances uh, to actually fall short of your obligation to seek out um, a job. But if there is suitable work identified, you get the one shot at it. If there is an utterly suitable job for you, then there really are no excuses and government shouldn't spend its time intensively case managing people that have given up on a perfectly suitable job. And so it's worth responding to this previous speaker, the member for Parramatta, who almost exclusively uh, uh, devoted her 15 minutes of parliamentary time to what I would call uh, you know, stories of grief and inability to meet basic requirements. And I would only say to the member for Parramatta, I'm not sure that you have actually gone through that period with your local Centrelink office of sitting with those workers as I have, talking to them about case management and watching what is required of someone to attend uh, what is called intensive case management with a, uh, a job seeking provider working for you and on your behalf. And she provided a list of uh, exceptional circumstances, all of which I accept. Recently, uh, having left prison, uh, having uh, an extremely traumatic uh, family uh, event in the time that you're looking for work, uh, a major medical condition, and probably the one that we all tend to forget uh, major mental health issues that can really make it difficult for you to make a sustained commitment. Uh, to seeking work. And I, I, I concede that this is one of the greatest challenges that our, um, our Centrelink and job uh, service uh, uh, providers face. But we have a disability support pension arrangement there specifically for people who can't do uh, four, hours, uh, four hours a fortnight of work. Uh, that's what that DSP is there for. So I want to confine my comments today to where I think I'm adding some uh, b benefit in this chamber if I'm going to be detaining parliamentary time, and that's the health reasons why you can't hold down a long-term job, uh, the parenting reasons why you can't hold down a long-term job. But before going there, I just want to note that we are at the moment working in the context of what other major economies are doing. UK is making significant advances in this area of maximising everyone's attempt to find a job. New Zealand has brought in extraordinary reforms. Um, information of which is available on their beehive around how they make sure that those that are most evading work, because they operate obviously in a single government level where they can share job seeking and payment information more easily than we can, uh, that they can pick up the people who are persistently evading opportunity, uh, which is clearly uh, running contrary to what our basic expectations would be of a citizen. I mean, the intellectual corollary of this whole debate comes from ACOS, uh, whose view is that government should not engage in any form of social engineering using a welfare payment to in some way change someone's behaviour. Well, there's a simple response to ACOS, isn't there? Paying of welfare is in and of itself social engineering. I mean, paying welfare is trying to obtain a different social outcome using a payment. It is utterly reasonable to strike an agreement with recipients that there are certain social norms that we would expect of people in receipt of a payment. And if you're sitting on the other side of this chamber, I'm telling you that's the way it's going, and get used to it, because all other OECD economies are moving in that way, and a conversation that we couldn't have 20 years ago we're having right now, and that is if you're in receipt of a public payment, it's not acceptable to beat up your wife. If you're destroying your tenancy, it's not acceptable to just keep taking your public payment. If you're not sending your kids to school, I don't see why any level of government should continue paying your welfare payments. These are basic rules that operate right around the world. And it's utterly reasonable that they're enforced here, and I'm glad to see that they are. They weren't always enforced, but they are now. There's still more challenges ahead, and these are not policies of any major party. But ultimately, we need to look at parenting orders that are flagrantly and persistently abused. If you are not adhering to a court-ordered sharing of your children with another partner, and that has been determined by a court in this country, I do not see why. You should then be receiving public payments unfettered. I do not see why you should then capture all of the parenting payments 
because you're refusing to share the child with the other parent who loses their payments. But that's how it works at the moment, and it's just not right. I don't see if you thumb your nose at state authorities and you're on the run with an arrest warrant, why on earth you should keep getting public payments. And I know that in New Zealand, when they changed this law, they had people turning up the police station saying, I've just had my payment stopped. And all of the police over there in New Zealand said, well, why are you here? They said, well, yeah, it's, a, it's an arrest warrant. You know, I'm on the run. Can I sort it out? Why on earth in this country do we pay people on the run to stay on the run? Why wasn't this ever picked up in six years of Labor government? No, no, no. Quite happy to keep paying that out to people who are on the run with an outstanding arrest warrant. And I concede we should give people on the run 14 days to get to Centrelink, but why should we pay those payments to people who are on the run for months and months? And lastly, I want to pick up the issue of, uh, of, of not actually looking after vulnerable children. I mean, at some point, the state does have to take that fearful step into a home and say, if you cannot support your children in a safe environment, we have to ask you for some mutual activity in return. And that may well be ensuring that kids are immunised. That's non-controversial and we do it already. But what about the other range of health care that I think a completely dependent child should be able to trust the state will deliver? And I don't th see that children's health should be compromised and that welfare should be paid without some concern to the fact that a child at the age of five should be able to turn up healthy enough to be able to cope at school, able to hold a pencil, knowing which side of a book to open, able to sit in a class with 20 other kids and not throw chairs through a window. I mean, basic emotional self-regulation is something we should be picking up with our Medicare system and making sure that every child has a chance. Because education is a train, and if you can't make that back carriage when you're five, it's bloody hard to get back on again. These will be challenges for future governments, but they're challenges for all governments. But in the context of stronger penalties, for persistent evaders of what we would regard as just reasonable behaviour, caring for a child, preventing absolutely all forms of domestic violence, not damaging a public tenancy, not running up massive debts to a state government but then having the federal government still paying you, I think it's time we looked at these areas and I'm glad we now have a government that will do that. Of course, most of the state entities aren't recognised under the Act and can't actually be, um, activate a mandatory deduction from Centrelink payments. At the moment it's optional through centre pay, and I can see that that works in a number of cases and fails in other. That's a debate for the future, but I say to this place this debate is not far off. It's not very far off. Back to the persistent evaders of work. And to these people, if there are genuine reasons, these will be picked up in compulsory conferencing. And this trigger is activated the minute there have been three activity requirements that have been breached in a six-month period. And anyone on this side of the chamber who says that you know, our highly, highly expert Centrelink staff and their associated speci um, spe uh, specialists, and I talk about social service specialists, can't identify when someone has a genuine illness, when someone genuinely needs to be streamed out of uh, this kind of activity, I mean, you completely underestimate, uh, Deputy Speaker, they completely underestimate the capacity of our officials to do that. I have a slightly different concern. Just how many people can Centrelink be expected to intensively case manage? I mean, I've got a number of people in the gallery today listening. I mean, realistically, how many people can we conference for hours on end at taxpayers' expense? In the end, we need a system that finds those who can most easily be directed back to work and get them there. And there's nothing more effective than saying you face a significant penalty if you don't show up. If you've got a problem, you have to let us know. It's not that hard to get to a Centrelink office in the country to make it clear that you can't make it. It's a basic tenet to say to someone, if you can't meet an obligation, let them know in advance. Now, we can make all the excuses about social uh, inability to do that and, and, and that sort of thing, but that is, that's taken care of by doctors. Doctors are quite able to diagnose that kind of inability to be continu continually able to turn up and look for work. If you've got a problem, go and see a doctor. And if that doctor, your family doctor, can't do that, we should also have Centrelink doctors able to make that decision if a person persistently uses medical certificates to evade work. I mean, if someone has a medical condition that only flares up on the day they're meant to show up to work, well, let it be determined by a Centrelink doctor. And I anticipate there'll be a tightening up in this area too. We have the obvious improvement that you can't use any more a family doctor to get your DSP. Thank you to the opposition for introducing that uh, piece of legislation. Why should it not ap apply in this situation as well? I don't expect to see a Labor Party opposing that important measure 
that there should be some independent medical advice where there is frequent use of medical certificates to avoid finding work. Look, all of this happens in a platform, a platform of trying to get young people back into work um, using the job commitment bonus, Order. a platform to try and Order. get people to move for work. Order. Using the member for Bowman's time has expired, and I thank you for his contribution.